Devoid of Space is a space horror anthology. The contents of these episodes may not be for everyone, so please listen with care. This episode part, case name Saturn, contains the following content warnings. Self-harm, body horror, disordered eating, and implied intent to harm a child. This is a case review for the file of Mr. Recorded Medical Research Station Persepolis Doctor Speaking Before I begin, after reading through the file and interviewing Mr. for this review, and with apologies to the review board for my language, I'd like to take a moment to speak directly to the as-yet unidentified member of our intake staff who looked over the preliminary file for Mr. X's case and decided to classify that file under the case name Saturn. Fuck you. Fuck you, you miserable prick. We may be researchers, but we are also doctors. And these people aren't just test subjects, they are our patients. Whatever else is happening to them, however much they did or didn't sign up for this, they are goddamn human beings who deserve to be treated with at least a bare minimum of respect. They do not deserve to have cruel and tasteless jokes made at their expense, no matter how fucking clever you think those jokes are. Despite standard protocol, I will not be using the case name to refer to Mr. over the course of this review. And whoever has to go through and redact Mr. X's name out of the recording, you can thank the intake department for that. All right, now that that's off my chest. Subject is a white male, age 43 years subjective, 45 years Earth standard. 170 centimeters tall, massing roughly 125 kilograms. Despite that high body mass ratio, the subject appears to be of slim to medium build. The only external signs of Mr. X's particular affliction, apart from his abnormally high mass, are a slight distension of the lower abdomen and a large number of visible scars, particularly on the subject's lips and hands. Internally, however, it appears that prolonged exposure to the Simmer-type high-energy distortion field from one of our FIR-300 series drive cores has altered Mr. X's physiology substantially from human baseline. Changes observed include a highly elevated base temperature, extremely high drug tolerance, and some kind of rapid healing factor. But the most radical deviation is in the subject's digestive tract, where both the upper and lower intestine and the stomach have been replaced by a single large organ of unknown origin. Based on the results from MRI and full-spectrum tomography, the organ appears to be roughly cylindrical, approximately 45 centimeters long by 20 wide, tapering slightly toward the posterior end. Beyond its basic shape, we've been unable to determine anything further about the makeup of the organ. Whatever it's composed of is magnetically inert, but opaque to X-ray, ultrasound, radio, low-energy gamma radiation, and everything else. We've tried to shine through it to get a picture of what might be inside. Endoscopic and micro-robotic examination of the organ via the upper GI tract have failed 
to generate any result of note, save the loss of three probes and the partial destruction of two scopes. Surgical investigation to examine the organ has also failed, due to both the subject's aforementioned rapid healing factor and to his being nearly immune to every variety of anesthetic we attempted to administer over the course of the attempted surgical examination. The interior end of the organ appears to be connected directly to the subject's esophagus. There also appear to be a large number of direct connections between the organ and the subject's nervous, lymphatic, and circulatory systems. And certain statements and behaviors from the subject suggest the nerve connections may extend directly into the subject's limbic system as well. Notably, the organ does not appear to be connected to the subject's renal system at all, nor does it connect to what remains of the lower end of the subject's digestive tract. Mr. Anderson has reported that he's felt no need to urinate or defecate since his body began changing and has not been observed to do so since he was recovered by one of our special medical outreach teams and brought to Persepolis for further study approximately five weeks ago. The subject appeared to be in a state of acute psychological distress upon initial recovery and has had a number of further outbursts while under observation. So far, however, he has remained extremely cooperative with Xerxes' medical personnel and has not attempted to leave his observation suite. Requests made by the subject to the staff have been minimal and mostly acceptable. A number of meal modifications and substitutions, some admittedly a bit odd but not unreasonable, a request that we not attempt further surgical intervention made after our first attempt to do so, and a standing request that he not be allowed access to his child, who was recovered at the same time as Mr. <laughs> and is currently being cared for by staff from the Child Development Wing here on Persepolis. In light of Mr. X's cooperation, and in the interest of not causing him further emotional distress, I recommend we continue granting most of these requests. And in particular, I recommend we begin processing a transfer for the aforementioned child into a more long-term fostering arrangement. Also, while I know we will eventually need to resume surgical exploration of the organ, I'd suggest we wait until we've found an effective method of anesthetizing the subject, for both Mr. X's continued well-being and the well-being of the staff performing the operation. <sighs> End case review. My interview with the subject is attached. It is all right if I record this, Mr. A I guess. What would happen if I said no? If you didn't want to be recorded, but were still willing to talk, I'd turn off the recorder, and we'd have our conversation. I'd take notes. When we were done, I'd try to write down as much of what was said as I could remember, and honestly, I would probably get some of it wrong. Do you want me to turn off the recorder? No, it's fine. Not sure what I can tell you that I haven't told the other doctors and medtechs. I'm looking to capture more of an overview of your case, the big picture. When did you first notice a change in your condition? I guess it must have been about two months into our shakedown run with the new engine. The captain wanted to see how hard we could push and how fast really put the engine your people sold us through its paces to see if it was everything they'd claimed it was. We were pushing hard to try to complete the whole Terra trade loop in one quarter, 
So they had us technical folks running double shifts. And we were all going pretty ragged. I was at my workbench, rewiring some power components, and I've got a bulb of coffee sitting there on the bench. We're not supposed to have food or drink in the engineering section, but everyone brings down at least coffee from the mess, and the command crew knows better to stand between the engineering staff and their mild stimulants. Don't want anybody to start taking something stronger, something they feel like they need to hide, right? Anyway, I'm focused on the rewire, and so I don't even really notice that when I go to grab my coffee, what I pick up instead is a wash bottle of industrial solvent. And before I even have time to think about what I'm doing, I put the nozzle in my mouth and squeeze the bottle. Just give myself a great big mouthful. Interesting. This was accidental? I... I think so. I mean, I certainly didn't think to myself, time to drink some Unisolve. I wasn't suicidal or anything like that, but... Maybe it was an accident. Maybe the thing was nudging me toward it subconsciously. I don't know for sure. I would spit it out the moment I realized what I'd done. It came out streaked with blood and the inside of my mouth burned like, well, I'd been, like, well, it'd been full of something designed to dissolve organic substances on contact, but the taste of it was good. Really good. In a way that's hard for me to describe. Do you mean it tasted like something other than solvent? Not really. I don't even really know if you can say a liquid that dissolves taste buds on contact has a flavor, but it was more like like good liquor or strong black coffee. Maybe something that doesn't taste good by the standard you judge other food by, but... Like an acquired taste, you mean? Something like that, I guess. It was like I'd suddenly developed an acquired taste for this fucking poison. I go to the ship medic tell them what happened. They take a quick look in my mouth and tell me to get back to work and not waste their time. To come up with a better excuse next time. I tell them I'm not lying and they say if I've had a mouthful of Unisolve my mouth would be a bloody mess and my teeth would be falling out but my mouth looks fine so it must not have been Unisolve. But when I go back to my bench the wash bottle is still sitting there clearly labeled with a whole row of hazard symbols and just the fumes from it are enough to scorch my nose hairs, but the moment I get a whiff of it, my mouth just starts watering. I held out for two days before I tried it again. At first, the urge was manageable, but it just got stronger the longer I held off. And by the end of that second day, it was like I hadn't eaten in a week, and that bottle was a full five-course dinner. So, slow and careful, I squeeze out another mouthful, and this time, I swallow. It was... scorching. Burned ten times as bad as the roughest engine steel hooch I've ever tried. I swear I could feel it peel the roof of my mouth away, turn my throat inside out, but under all that, at the back of my mind, I could feel that hungry part of me going, mm mm and the moment the pain receded, I couldn't help but take another swig. I drunk the rest of that wash bottle and half of another one before it stopped tasting good. That was the first thing it made me hungry for. Can you tell me some of the other things you consumed? Some of the other things that, as you say, it made you hungry for? There were a few different chemical solutions. Cleansers, degreasers, machine lubricants, some textiles, plastics, circuit boards, lithium power cells, a whole tube of toothpaste, tube and all. A fair amount of stainless steel, screws and bolts mostly. Copper wire, solder and flux, a variety of diodes and relays and ICs. A whole aluminum fork from the mess once. Sometimes I'd see something in a hollow or read about something in an article and the hunger would kick in for something there was no way I could get a hold of. Eventually that hunger would pass, but it felt like the next one would always be stronger, feral almost, and always for something painful. Like the thing was punishing me for not giving it what it wanted, 
fuck, sometimes it happened multiple times with the same thing. There was this, this stupid pair of Maglock work boots I kept seeing ads for. Way out of my budget, even if I'd wanted to keep them and not. Well, you know. I'd see this ad, have to spend three or four days with hunger pangs I couldn't get rid of. Then it'd have me drink down etching acid or choke down a whole power converter. And the next day I'd see the same ad and it'd start all over again. Eventually I bought the damn things on credit, sliced them up and swallowed them down. I gave in. Eventually I always give in. Can you tell me what happened to you last month? Just before our team brought you in? Please. Any information you can give us could help us determine how best to treat your condition. My, my son, he'd been staying with his grandmother on Vesta while I was away, but her MLM had started getting bad again, so I came back home, started working odd jobs so I could try and take care of both of them. For about a month, it was okay. I ate a few more rocks than I was used to doing, but other than that, it was quiet. Almost normal. And then one day, Zachary comes home from school, and I look down at him at the little table in our apartment, and I sent him to stay with a friend that night. Tried to keep away from him as much as I could, but I'd been away so long. All he wanted to do was spend time with me, and I couldn't look at him without... After four days, I told him to stay away from me. And when he said he didn't understand, I shouted and cursed and smashed this antique glass pitcher we had against the wall, yelling at him to get out, get away, run. And he did run, finally hid in his room, called his grandmother who called someone, who called your people, I guess. And when I looked down at those big, ugly, curved shards of glass, and felt hungry for them instead, I fucking wept for joy. And I sliced open my fingers and cut up my lips, shoving that glass down into my fucking throat with a fucking smile on my face. Which, I guess, is what I was doing when your people found me. That is consistent with the reports I've read, yes. Thank you, Mr. A I know that was difficult for you. If there's anything I or anyone else at Xerxes Medical can do to make your stay on Persepolis more comfortable, please let us know. No, I just... You can't let me see him again. You can't let it see him again. Not unless you find a way to get this thing out of me. I can't let it make me feel like that not again not ever again please just just keep him away from me I'll make the necessary arrangements thank you for your time Devoid of Space is a sci-fi horror anthology created and produced by Charlie Caruso Neal. It is an affiliate of Law of Names Media. You can find more information at devoidofspace.lawofnames.com or on our Twitter at Devoid of Space. The part of Dr. H was played by Corvin Appleby. Saturn is played by Sean Geddes. This episode, the Xerxes Report, Case Name Saturn was written by James Big and was edited by Jesse. The music was written by Michael Fytag and the logo was created by Cassie Cruz O'Neill. Remember, this space is anything but safe. <laughs>